Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Coming to you live and direct from Pioneer Plaza here in beautiful downtown Honolulu. And, uh, you know, with all the energy stuff going on on the East Coast, and I, I call that hurricane energy, I almost did today's show on just natural energy. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a show with uh, the godfather of ocean thermal energy, and it just so happened we were having thunderstorms that day, and I pointed out that when you have a thunderstorm, it releases so much energy in the form of thunder, lightning, and rain. How does all that millions of gallons of water get up into the sky without an incredible amount of energy to move it? I think one of these days we're going to do a show on weather and talk about the energy in weather. Because when you really get down to the nuts and bolts, the amount of energy in weather systems is incredibly powerful, incredibly huge. So our hearts are out to the folks impacted, especially in the Bahamas and uh, the folks on the East Coast that are still feeling the effects of Hurricane Dorian and hope you can recover quick and get back to normal. In today's show, we're gonna talk a little bit on the more practical side about solar energy. We kind of got led up to that by a couple of discussions we've had recently. Um, starting with Ryan Wubins, and we started talking about, you know, how practical is it for the individual to just start doing stuff to become a little bit more carbon neutral. Our guest today is Bill Brooks from the Big Island. He's a friend of mine that's uh, lived on the Big Island quite a while and done a whole lot of uh, solar panel work and solar energy work. And um, we're going to talk to him a little bit about some of the things that you want to think about as you consider putting solar on your facility, whether it's a commercial facility or a personal uh, residence, private residence. You know, what's the practical sides of it? You know, how many panels do you think you might need? What are the weather and climate conditions and locations that affect how much electricity you're gonna get out of your solar panels and things like that? So Bill, welcome to the show and uh, thanks for joining me. Appreciate having you on. And if if you could start off, could you give the, the audience a little bit of an idea of uh, your credentials yourself? You know, what got you into doing uh, solar work and, and give, us a, give us a little bit of a picture of your background. Sure. When I moved to the islands 47 years ago, one of the first things that I noticed was the state fact that the state was 98% at that point dependent upon imported fossil fuel from countries that didn't like us to create our electrical energy. It didn't take much for me to realize that there had to be better alternatives. And so I started, it, got into the solar business, became one of the first solar contractors in Hawaii way back then, and have been tied into the industry uh, ever since in one capacity or another. Uh, currently, I'm a independent consultant, represent a number of different entities, contractual entities, and uh, specialize obviously in solar and storage mediums as well as conservation measures. So I've got an extensive background in every facet of the business from uh, the conservation side of it as well as alternative. Okay. So um, are you up to speed on some of the newer solar technologies? Like what kind of efficiencies are we getting out of the, the current um, solar panels? And is there a quality difference between solar panels like maybe made in China versus made in the USA? Is, is that an issue? Well, I mean, it only from the standpoint of you always, no matter where the company is from that's manufacturing, the main thing you want to look at is the financial stability of the entity that's the manufacturer because you're dealing with a technology that has a lifespan here. So you want to make sure that the company that's manufacturing the panels that you're buying are, is going to be around 25 years from now or 15, 20 if you have a warranty issue. So that's the biggest consideration, I would say. As far as the efficiency, Efficiencies increased dramatically over the you know last 20 years, and now we're seeing just recently you know panels that are coming out same size panels that we were dealing with before that were you know even less than 200 watts per panel. Now you can buy panels that are you know as much as 380 watts per panel that don't take up uh, anything significantly 
more in the way of roof space. So that, that 300 to 380 watt panel Better. is what size? Is that like two feet by three feet or two feet by four feet? What, what's, what's the typical size for a 300 to 380 watt panel? Uh, yeah, it's going to be a little over five uh, feet and a uh, little Okay, so so we're, we're having a little video issue with um, with Bill. We're going to try and connect him back up. But the reason I'm asking him these questions is because when you start to do the math to figure out how much um, solar you're going to put on your roof, and if you have enough room on your roof in the right direction to start lining up your solar, you know, you first have to dis decide how many watts of solar you need and storage and things like that, and whether it's going to fit on your roof. So we're trying to establish here um, the amount of solar you can connect to your roof. So if you know how many watts a, a panel is, and if the panel is like three feet by five feet, um, you figure out how many, uh, how many square feet you got for roof space. Does it face the south or pretty predominantly the south? And if so, um, how, do we, how do we work on uh, calculating whether or not you can hook up that much power and make it fit on your roof. So, Bill, you know, we're, we're talking about um, the, the efficiency of the new solar panels. And with 380 watts of power, between 300 and 380 watts of power on, the, on a typical panel, how big is that panel? And that kind of gives us a starting point of at least how many panels will fit on the south side of someone's house. So, what, what's the typical size for a 300 to a 380 watt panel? Yeah, it's going to be a little over five feet by a little over three feet. Then keep in mind that the wattage of the individual panel, uh, you know, it, it, you know, 380 is definitely not average. That's like uh, one of the higher efficiency panels. One of the things you want to keep in mind is, one, that you're not restricted to your south-facing roof with uh, photovoltaics. With solar thermal, it's, uh, the importance of direct solar gain is much more significant, whereas with PV or photovoltaics, uh, the efficiency isn't as uh, directly impacted by going to like a southwest or southeast or even east-west orientations can work. And the, uh, whether or not you want to go with the most efficient panel would depend entirely upon the uh, availability of roof area. In other words, if your demand is such to where you've got plenty of roof space or uh, the panel area needed, then you can go with a panel that has a, with a reputable manufacturer and a less efficient panel and accomplish the same thing at a lower cost. You're going to pay premium, obviously, for the most efficient panels. And the place where that comes into play and, and is the most valuable is where you're really tight with roof space availability and where the, uh, that is a critical factor. So, hope that helps. Okay. So, what are some of the, the, the main considerations for deciding whether it's right for a, a, especially as a residential customer to, if they wanted to completely go off the grid, because I, I know you do energy storage too, and that's kind of important. If you were gonna decide to take your house completely off the grid, I tell people that the first thing they need to know is from their electric bill, what their average daily use in kilowatt hours is. Um, and then we can kind of get a rough idea of, of how many panels you need but then you also have to take into account what are your surge or your peak loads that you might have on your on your system. So it's not just the average amount of energy you need across the day, but when you really stress your system, what are some of the shock loads or the peak loads that you're going to have? And that's probably where your battery storage or your your storage system uh, and your inverters come in to to be sized right. So could you give us an idea yeah. of that relationship between? Overall, how many panels do you need, um, size of inverter, and number of batteries and stuff, how those kind of all play together when you're figuring out your residential uh, solar system? Yes, you hit the nail on the head. In other words, uh, it's not just about coming up with how much power you need to produce every day, but it also 
determines your, like you're saying, your, the load factor of the home. In other words, if you've got large uh, electric ranges, et cetera, you need to look at, okay, what's the peak load going to be on that system at any particular time? And then you have to size inverters and storage capacity to be able to deal with that. One of the factors that uh, most people overlook is conservation. When you're in, in sizing a system for your home, when I'm doing that, I look at, okay, what's your daily, average daily consumption? That's the first place to start, correct. But then you want to look. When I look in, and I'm doing a site evaluation, and I see they have a nice pool, first thing I do is I go into that pump room and I look. If they've got a conventional two-horsepower pump in there, then the first thing I do is say, okay, before we do anything else, you need to replace this pump with a state-of-the-art pump with a variable frequency drive and a microprocessor. And they'll say, well, I've heard about that. You know, it could cost, you know, it's going to cost a little less than $2,000 or whatever. And I point out to them, yes, but it'll pay for itself much, much faster than anything else you can do. And a system like, for an example, that usually will pay for itself in less than two years, between a year and two years. And whereas once you start looking at ways to conserve that are more economically viable than the alternative energy, then that's one factor. The other thing that comes into play with anybody who's going to do solar, and especially where they're looking at offsetting their entire load and wanting to be independent, is you need to say, okay, what's happening in the future? Do you see an electric vehicle in your, if now if you're going to invest in solar, do you want to invest in enough to where you can uh, have stop paying for fossil fuel as well. Or a lot of people will start thinking, well, you know, if I don't have to pay health code 38 cents a kilowatt or 40 cents a kilowatt or whatever it is, hour, then, you know, I'd really love to do a jacuzzi or throw in a jacuzzi or a sauna or whatever. Those so other amenities that they were not doing when they were like, so concerned about their electric bill. So all of those factors kind of come into the picture, and that's through counseling and what have you, where you get to a calculation of what the projected energy consumption on a daily basis will be. And then from there, that's when you start doing the engineering to design and figure out exactly how much you need in the way of panel reduction capacity and energy storage capacity as well as charge controllers and inverters, et cetera. Do you have kind of a rough rule of thumb that you use um, so that, you know, like when you talk to a residential customer and let, let's say, for example, um, his average use per day is um, 30, 30 kilowatt hours per day. And kind of, can you give us a rough idea of how much a system like that would cost if you wanted battery storage and like off the grid capability, what would like a, a 30 kilowatt hour day house run? And I'm, of course, we're not gonna hold this to a bid, but just some- No, 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 and, and not only that, but it's really kind of hard to say because it can vary significantly. In other words, uh, I, I try never, when people ask me that question as a general rule, I don't want to keep numbers in my mind or that kind of stuff. That's why I do the engineering. But the other factor that comes into play, it could vary from, say, you know, forty something thousand to seventy something thousand, all depending on the, you know, the quality of the panel that sure. you're going to use as far as efficiency goes. Which battery storage systems you're going to use? In other words, do you want to go with a the more lower end battery system that's not going to last you as long, or do you want the best? And there is a significant difference between the two. The best, as a general rule, actually pays for or has a better price per kilowatt hour of storage capacity than the cheaper ones, but you got to pay more up front for it. So these are all things that come into play when you start actually coming up with a uh, total number of what an installation is going to cost. Okay. And uh, that okay. makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I tell you what, we're going to take a quick break here so that we can talk about some of the other shows on ThinkTech. We'll be back with Bill in about 60 seconds. Aloha. My name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of ThinkTech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. 
My program airs every other Monday at 1 o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii. Most of my programs deal with my own life and law experience. Recently, I interviewed Alex Jempel, who I have known for over 30 years, about his voyage across the sea as a lawyer from Tokyo to Hawaii. Those are the type of stories that I like to bring and like to talk about. Human stories about law and life. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Wendy Lowe, and I want you to join me as we take our health back. On my show, all we do is talk about things in everyday life, in Hawaii or abroad. I have guests on board that will just talk about different aspects of health in every, in every way, whether it's medical health, nutritional health, diabetic health, you name it, we'll talk about it. Even financial health, we'll even have some of the Miss Hawaii's on board and all the different topics that I feel will make your health and your lifestyle a lot better. So come join me. I welcome you to take your health back. Mahalo. This is Stan, the energy man with Bill Brooks. And, uh, and also, a reminder for those of you that are faithfully watching Standard Energy Man every week and you, you set your clock so that you can, can pick me up. We're going to be moving time slots on the 17th of September and Standard Energy Man will start broadcasting live at 3 p.m. on Tuesday starting September 17th. So that show on September 17th will also be uh, brought in live from the Big Island. I'll be on the Big Island and I'm planning to talk to the folks at Blue Planet Research. Um, and uh, Bill hangs out at Blue Planet Research, so maybe we'll even have him on again on the 17th and talk a little bit more with Paul. Anyway, thanks for joining us. And we've got uh, Bill Brooks, uh, an energy specialist, has been on the island for almost a half a century. And uh, we're talking about solar panels for your house. And um, he's been around the block once or twice, so uh, he pretty much knows this stuff inside and out. So, Bill, you know, one of the things that we need to, to look at is um, like you said, our future needs for our, our, our electric uh, household, and granted, some things are getting more efficient, like um, LED lights and things like that. And, uh, but, but if you want to put a car, you know, electric car into your future, and you want it to charge it on your house, there's different kind of chargers, and I know that uh, that makes a huge difference. So you know, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, what you would recommend to a customer if say they, they had a, a Nissan Leaf versus a Tesla and they wanted to put it in their, in their house and charge it at night? Yeah, the, the main thing that comes into play when you start choosing the EV that you want is looking at the driving patterns. In other words, I have a client who is home, has a business at his home, and he has a Leaf. Now, he is a underwater photographer, drives his longest trip as a general rule is to the airport to fly out to someplace else to do photography there or Costco or something like that. So in a situation like that, you know, that type of vehicle works really well. I mean, at this point in time, I mean, his business, his home, and his transportation, basically all covered from, uh, by the sun, powered by the sun. And at this point, he's already covered his investment and is doing it all for free. So it depends a lot on the distance that the person is going to be traveling and because the capacity of the vehicle can vary dramatically, you know, like a Model X, you know, that has 90, uh, 90, a little over 90 kilowatt hours of storage just within the vehicle. So that gives you a feel of what it would take to charge the vehicle from uh, zero to uh, 100%. So, you know, versus a leaf, which is going to require much less. And then also, you need to look at, okay, how critical is it for me, the time to, the time that it takes, and that's going to be the determining factor of whether you want a, a high voltage and uh, charging station at your home that will charge relatively rapidly versus something where you can just plug it in and program, you know, stay, uh, set your plan your battery storage scenario to where you can come home at night and you've got enough storage to power your home and to charge your vehicle through the evening and take plenty of time to do it. So all of those factors come into play. And these are things that the average individual has to look at in order to make intelligent 
intelligent decisions about what's going to serve them best. So it's kind of just, it's definitely one of those things where it's uh, not one, one shoe fits all kind of thing. It's, it all depends on a lot of extenuating circumstances. And there's going to be more and more. There's already quite a few options out there in the way of EV uh, possibilities and associations to get involved with. If you own an electric vehicle on the Big Island, there's associations that uh, are have been created and they definitely stay in touch with each other to apprise each other of state-of-the-art technologies and things of that nature and new you know, remote charging stations, et cetera. Yeah, so the, 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 that was really a focus of having you on the show today is just to talk about some of these variables that people need to be aware of when they actually start working with a contractor to build their system, to be aware of some of the things they need to keep in mind about designing their system and not just let the contractor kind of sell them what they want to sell them, but sell them what they need, which is, uh, you know, if they do have a, a higher capacity vehicle in the future that's electric, then when you, when you said that was a Model X is like 92 kilowatt hours of, of battery storage, that's huge. Yeah. The, the big buses that we build for the Air Force only have 28 kilowatt hours of battery storage, and that, that's, that's like three times what our bus runs with. So that, that's a heck of a lot of batteries. But anyway, we digress. Um, what's one of the uh, um, issues with the electric company now? If you want to um, have solar on your roof, especially, and this is Helco, I know you deal with a lot with the Big Island, so we'll deal with the Hawaiian Electric Light Company. If you were a homeowner on the Big Island and you said, hey, I just want to be off the grid, or I, I want to stay connected to the grid just in case I need you, um, what are some of the factors in there when you're when you're deciding how to be uh, configuring your house? Well, there's there's something. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there's they have for those people who have an existing system already under the old net energy metering system NEM program. They for up until just recently, if you had that contract with the utility, you could not alter your system at all without voiding that agreement. They've come out with a NIM plus agreement where you can actually expand your system, add storage to your system, and enhance the effectiveness and efficiency of your system significantly that was not available. So that for NIM the people who have a NIMP system. But those who do not have it didn't get in on the NIM program when it was available. Now they have a customer generation. They have several different facets of that. And it's basically such that for the average person, if you're going to add solar, you want to do storage because you do not want to pay fifty to seventy thousand dollars for a uh, solar system and then turn around and push your energy into the utility and have them sell it back to you. And that's basically the way that the customer generation system works. You can store your energy in the grid, but when you pull it back, you get a nominal, you know, 15 cents or so a kilowatt hour for the power that you're pushed in and pulled back out. And you're paying for the difference. And with the utility rates that we have here on the Big Island, obviously it does not make sense. So anybody who's doing that as a general rule is going to go with storage, even if they're going to stay grid tight. And there can be some advantages of that where you don't have to worry about having a generation, a generator and what have you that you would definitely want to have if you were going to be totally off grid. You'd want a hybrid system to where you have your own generator. And you can definitely do that. We have systems where we can set you up totally off grid, where you have your own solar power system, your own storage system. And if anything happens, and for instance, your battery storage gets down too low, it will automatically turn on a generator and keep that system charged up until the sun comes out again. So all those things are possible. If you're going to stay grid connected, then you're just simply using the grid. The biggest advantage of being totally uh, independent is that if there is a you know, major earthquake or hurricane or what have you that impacts us to where the utility is down for a significant period of time, that means that you need to be able to rely on your system totally 
itself. And that's the advantage, even with the grid type system of having the batteries, then you're not dependent upon the, the grid and your system does not go down when the grid goes down. So those are all factors that kind of come into play with making a decision about whether or not to stay grid tight or to go totally off grid. And people who are already off grid and it's going to cost significant money to bring in utility to begin with, then it makes a lot of sense just to do your own off grid system. Okay, we have that about, help? We, that's perfect. And we have about two minutes left. And the two things I want to hit on are number one, if you're going to hire a contractor um, to do this, uh, how do you pick a good contractor? And I'll, I'll let you answer that one first. Well, in choosing a contractor, again, just think, look at the same thing that you would look at from uh, choosing a panel manufacturer. There's no problem in going with Asia-made panels. There's some extremely well-made panels. And even, you know, like RAC out of the, uh, the uh, Northern Europe and what have you, they're manufacturing in Asia and what have you. So you can have high quality panels from anywhere. With contractors, the main thing that you want to look at is, is this person going to be around, you know, 15 years from now uh, when I have an issue and I need my system serviced? Because the bottom line is no contractor likes to go on a roof after another contractor because whoever is on that roof last is the one who is liable. And so as a general rule, that I would say is the biggest thing to look at. Look to make sure that this is someone that you feel confident is going to be around 15, 20 years or more from now. And uh, it's just a company that has that kind of stability and staying power. And ideally, it has other, uh, how can I say, sources of revenue. In other words, an electrical contract that is not strictly dependent upon the, uh, the you know, in a grid tied solar or whatever uh, to make a decision. In other words, that means that if, if something happens to the economy, they're likely going to survive the downturn, et cetera. Does that make sense? Uh, it does make sense. So my last question is actually a little bit more on the mechanical side. Um, if you, what, what's the average voltage system that a residence would have. I mean, our car uses a 12 volt DC system, but I know that uh, when you're when you're building some of these systems, you want to go with 24 or 48 volts. What, what's kind of the typical residential voltage system you set up with your DC electrics? Yeah, with the current uh, uh, state of the art technologies now, you want, as a general rule, 48 volt okay. system minimum. And you can go or even to higher voltage systems, especially if you're going into commercial or larger scale scenarios, there's, you know, you can go with much higher voltage systems. But as a general rule, the, if you're doing a typical, even typical residential, I would recommend, you know, a 48 volt system. Okay. And at, at, at the very least. All right, Bill. Well, the thanks. old days, I mean, you, you, the old days of 12 volt systems, uh, the, uh, are for all intents and purposes gone. Okay. Well, we could we could start getting into a series in parallel connecting of 12 volt systems, but that'll, that's going to have to be for another show because we run out of time already. But uh, hey, Bill, I want to thank you for uh, joining an especially short notice like you did and uh, helping us uh, look at our individual you know thoughts on how we might convert our own homes to solar and things we have to think about. So I appreciate your time today. I look forward to seeing you next well, week when, when I'm on the Big Island. There you go. And uh, thank you for what you guys are doing, Stan, with uh, educating people. And the more people learn about sustainability and how they can be part of the whole trend in that direction, the better off we as a state are going to be and the planet is going to be. So thank you so much for okay. your efforts. My pleasure. And we'll see you next week. And for the rest of you, uh, I'll see you next Friday on Stan Energy Man. Aloha.